Are there any questions about the previous lecture? Yes, sir. Is CPT an anti-unitary oxidant? Yes, anything that involves T in it is anti-unitary. Did we prove uh, last time that uh, the amplitude to go from, from one state to another is always CPT invariant? Yes, if we defined, when we found the proper definition of CPT, which you could, of course, have worked out yourself by multiplying our PT definition by our C definition. Yeah, well, what if we multiplied one of the states by uh, e to the i theta? Hmm? I mean, if, if we multiplied one of the states that, that, who's, uh, that we're finding the amplitude between by e to the i theta, then... Uh, no, no, no. The consequence of... Um, uh, what... Um, you say it says the S matrix between the initial state... Um, no, it takes care of itself. You see, the amplitude is... Um, it's, we phrase it in terms of the U's and the V's, okay? Now, uh, we, every U went into a V, and every U bar went into a V bar, okay? Now, the U is associated linearly with the associated particle state because the U is defined in terms of vacuum, psi of zero, say, the field, a one nucleon state, equals u. The v is associated, on the other hand, so if I change the phase of the one nucleon state, I change the definition of u by the same phase factor. Okay, the v's are associated antilinearly with the one antinucleon state. That's because, and these are free field operators, of course, describing asymptotic states, because the, uh, the, the U multiplies a nucleon creation operator, so the V multiply and the V multiplies, sorry, a nucleon annihilation operator, and the V multiplies an anti-nucleon creation operator, okay? So if we label <coughs> our states by U's and V's, all right, and I multiply the states by phase factors, the U's get multiplied by the phase factor, and the v's get multiplied by the conjugate phase factor. Okay? It's, well, if I change the phase of this anti-nucleon state by e the i theta, or change the phase of the nucleon state, okay, then in one case I'll get an e the i theta in the u, in the other case I'll get an e to the minus i theta in the v, because in one case the state is on the right, in the other case the state is on the left. So it doesn't matter, the I gamma 5 rule, okay, because <clears throat> if you start out with a nucleon, bunch of junk, nucleon, bunch of other junk, what TCP tells you is that this is anti-nucleon, bunch of other junk, S, the junk that was over here, TCP conjugate. So you, it wouldn't make sense then to look at the matrix between that and e to the i theta times the nucleon. No, you could. If you if you this says this is e to the i theta this, and this is e to the i theta that, and that's consistent with our rule, because for the incoming nucleon we have a u, and for the outgoing antinucleon, not for an incoming antinucleon, we have a v, and they're created connected by v equals equals i gamma five u. And I multiply this by e to the i theta. I multiply this by e to the i theta. And that's right. We have a linear formula between the u's and the v's. But the u's are associated with particles on the left, and the v's are associated, u's are associated with the particle on the right, and the v's are associated with the particle on the left. So that's consistent with the anti-unitarity of the operator, independent of the phase convention for the U's and the V's. Mm. Okay. okay. <coughs> I, I, is, I, I said it loud, that, but the, just be, that doesn't mean it's clear. So if it's not clear, ask and I'll try. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to think about it. How should I?
The incoming and outgoing state are, if it's a one nucleon cross scattering process, the incoming state is labeled by the U's and the outgoing state is labeled by the V's. <coughs> but the incoming, <coughs> but the, the relation between the state and the U here is linear and the state and the V here is antilinear and that makes the phase factors take care of themselves when you work it out. Yeah. Yes. Did you write down at any time uh, the transformation rules for both C, P, and T to go from size to whatever the transformation No, I wrote down the rules for, for C, P, and PT, from which you, by multiplication, can construct the rules for the other cases. Okay. <laughs> and what are the rules for C, P, and PT? Hmm? Well, a CP is uh, C times P, um, I mean, uh, times uh, I mean C, P, and P, D are the rules you looked at, right? Uh, oh, go, sure, on the states, yeah. On the, on the operators, u sub P, psi of x, u sub P, adjoint, is beta, psi of minus x, and T. u sub C adjoint, psi of x, u sub C, equals psi star of x, my Rana basis. And omega sub pt minus 1 psi of x omega pt equals i gamma 5 psi of minus x. Again, this, these two were worked out in the Majorana basis. Okay. Other questions? Yes, sir. I didn't understand your proof about the state's transform of your PT. Hmm? Uh, which part of the argument are you referring to? I don't quite understand uh, the question. Well, basically, you want to find out how the creation and violation squares transform under... Under PT. Yes, and you recall the result was, when I compare terms, that minus I gamma 5 sum on R, BP R, UR sub P, uh, start, is that right? Yeah. Equals omega PT, sum on R, omega PT inverse, BRP, no, sorry, wrong way. No, that's right. That's what I got, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm confused where the star came from. The star came, oh, you didn't know where the star came from. I'm sorry, it was on the other side, wasn't it? It was, um, yeah. It went like this. Excuse me, I'll write down the correct version of the equation. You wonder, you wonder about the origin of that equation. Is that the... Uh... Yeah, I think I that. Okay, well, the star came from the fact that omega was an anti-unitary operator. And this originally was a omega inverse all the way over on the left and omega all the way over on the right. When I bring u, a set of four numbers to an anti-unitary operator, it gets complex conjugated. Okay, is that a satisfactory answer? Other questions? Okay, yes. Um, do you see these, you all see each other? Uh, let's see. Um, I'm, let's see. Uh, well, we know the commutation. I've already worked out C and P. They, their commutation, their CP in one order is P, CP is PC times this rotation by 360 degrees. I worked that out in the lecture. Um, C squared is one. P squared is 1, PT squared is um, the rotation by 360 degrees again. So the only question is uh, P with PT and C with PT, which I really don't remember, but we can work them out from this if you want me to. <laughs> I mean, just work out what the two of them do in C one sequence and another, and if it changes the sign of psi, 
it's the rotation by 360 degrees, and if it doesn't, it's one. Other questions? Now, this lecture is devoted to the subject for which you have no doubt all been waiting, the discussion of renormalization for a, <laughs> of formulating the renormalization program for a theory involving spinner fields. As all we, as in the uh, Bosch case, I will uh, work with a specific example. And the example I will work with is our meson nucleon theory with gamma 5 interactions, referred to in the antique literature as the PS, PS, before anyone had ever discovered a meson, except the mu meson, which caused them infinite amount of confusion, uh, referred to, they thought it was the Yukawa particle that was making the forces between the nucleons and were very baffled. <laughs> See, it had around the right mass for the range of the nuclear forces. <laughs> and uh, the... Uh, the uh, theory referred to as PSPS, or pseudoscalar mesons with pseudoscalar couplings. There's a free fermion part, and since we're now going to do renormalization, I will tell you that this is not equal to the real mass, the observed mass of the one nucleon state. There's a meson part. And this is not the real meson mass. And there is a coupling constant. And this may not be the coupling constant as defined by some hypothetical experiment, say by looking for the T-channel pole and nucleon-nucleon scattering. <coughs> the, um, now, uh, let's remember. Uh, Also, of course, not only are these not the right, the physically defined masses and coupling constants, these are also not the most useful fields for scattering theory. In particular, for the case of the uh, meson field, we know we have to do a wave function renormalization and introduce a wave function renormalization counter term to get the right S matrix. And of course, that goes through in exactly the same way as before with uh, no alterations, because none of our general formulas depended on the presence of a nucleon field in the theory. Everything we got, all those expressions we got for the meson propagator and so on were true whether or not there were other fields in the theory. They just used the transformation laws of the meson field. So we have to study the vacuum expectation values of the meson field, which of course is independent of space by translational invariance. And in this case, this equals 0 by parity, so we don't have to introduce a shift. Since the vacuum is parity even, the meson field, which is pseudoscalar with this kind of coupling, has vanishing vacuum expectation value. <coughs> so one complication we had present in our scalar theory is not present here, although, of course, it would be true in the theory with scalar coupling then we would, it would not be the, sorry, this would not be the case in the theory with scalar coupling, then the meson could develop a vacuum expectation value and we would have to make a shift. The next stage is to study this object, which by general grounds we know this where this is a one meson state, not a one nucleon or one anti-nucleon state. And uh, <clears throat> this object we defined to be z3 to the 1 half. We know by Lorentz invariance it cannot depend on p if the states are relativistically normalized. And therefore, we have to um, introduce a field phi prime, which was z3 to the minus 1 half phi. That had good matrix elements, the same amplitude as a free field for making a one particle state out of the vacuum or annihilating a one particle state. Or when I should say, by convention, we define the phase of the one particle state so that z3 is a positive real number. <coughs> and that was the right state to use in, that was the right field to use in the reduction formula and the one that gave, you the, gave us the correct S matrix elements. Now, 
We want to do exactly the same thing for the nucleon field. The only count, first step is to study the amplitude for um, annihilating or creating, annihilating a nucleon state or creating an antinucleon state. As before, we need only study one matrix element, say the annihilation amplitude. And again, I will assume my states are relativistically normalized with those funny 2 pi of the cubes, 2 e sub p times the delta function, so that I don't have, so they have nice simple Lorentz transformation properties. Again, I need only study um, a state with a, a field sandwich between a nucleon state and a vacuum. The one with the nucleon state, the corresponding matrix element with the nucleon state on the left is connected to this one just by complex conjugation. The corresponding operators involving psi bars are uh, connected to these by a charge conjugation invariance, which is preserved by this theory. Or in fact, if you were working with a non-charge -charge conserving theory, non-charge conjugation conserving theory by CPT. <laughs> so in general, this is the only one I have to study. If I study this one, the other ones all fall into line by trivial invariances. Because of Lorentz invariance, <coughs> I, if I define my state RP by boosting by an appropriately chosen acceleration a state at rest, where P sub naught is not the naught component of P, maybe I shouldn't call it that, I should call it P standard or something like that. It is a four vector that corresponds to a particle with momentum zero, where M is the actual physical mass of the nucleon. Uh, then um, the, uh, I can uh, know all of these if I know, well, sorry. Let me first write down the known pro assumed properties of the states. I assume, of course, I should have said this earlier. Sorry, cancel the last 30 seconds. I should have said this earlier. I assume that the spectrum of the states in the theory will resemble that in the free theory. There may be bound states or something like that, but there is a physical meson, stable, which has the properties of the meson state in the free theory as far as parity and Lorentz transformation properties go. It's a scalar and it's odd under parity. I will assume there is a physical nucleon, which of course this mass is not equal to M0, but it is a spin one-half particle carrying charge one and transforming under parity like the free nucleon does. <clears throat> so, the states of the nucleon can all be obtained by applying appropriate Lorentz boost to a nucleon at rest. The um, states at rest are two in number. By convention, I'll choose 1p0, particle at rest in state 1 to correspond to the particle that is spinning up. I will choose <coughs> Jz as the operator in Hilbert space. That is the angular, total angular momentum. I will choose the state Tp0, 2p0 to be obtained by applying the lowering operator in the usual way for a spin 1 half. That defines its phase and everything else. And thus, by applying symmetry generators, I can generate everything from a single particle state at rest spinning up. And therefore, I need only study the matrix elements of the nucleon field at position 0. <coughs> with the state spinning up and at rest. Once I have studied that, by Lorentz transformations and rotations, I know the general matrix element. Perhaps over here I should write down an equation I will use shortly. I will assume 
that this has the same, this is the descendant in some sense of the free nucleon. It has the parity transformation properties of a nucleon at rest spinning up. Parity does nothing to spin, and since the particle's at rest, it does nothing to the momentum. I haven't said anything about renormalization at the moment. I'm just making statements about the properties of the states I expect, I, I, I assume, are there in the theory. Certainly for weak coupling, these, there will be states like this, unless I've chosen the meson to be more than twice as massive as the nucleon, and we know what sort of changes to make there. We discussed those in the scalar case. And um, if, of course, if coupling gets very strong, God knows what's going to happen. The nucleon and meson might bind to make a bound state that's got uh, uh, parity minus and uh, spin one half. And then as I drag the coupling constant up further, that bound state may actually get much lighter than the original nucleon. Who knows? It's a relativistic problem. And then the nucleon might decay into that bound state plus a meson when it gets sufficiently light. So there won't be a state with parity, with spin one half and parity plus. There'll only be a state with spin one half and parity minus left. That's a logical possibility, but it's not one we'll ever encounter in any order of a perturbation expansion. So if we're focusing on perturbation theory, we don't have to worry about it. Although perhaps it's healthy to keep it in the back of our minds that some, some, something exotic like that might happen for extremely strong couplings. Okay. I mean, when you've got E equals MC squared to play with, the bound state could be lighter than either of the components. Who knows? But certainly for, 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 for any case where perturbation theory is valid, nothing like that is going to happen. Okay, does that answer your question? I mean, I haven't said a word about the renormalization program at, at, up to this stage. On this board, I've just written down the assumed exact properties of the exact one particle state, so the real eigenstates of the real H and real P. The full interacting theory. Full interacting theory. Right. The only states there are in the world. Okay, the real states. <laughs> now, let's compute the matrix elements of this thing. Psi is a four component object. So in principle, there could be four matrix elements here, one for each of the four components of psi. However, we have two conditions which we can use that define what this state is. One is this one that says it's spin one half, and the other is this one that says it's parity plus. Therefore, this could be written as, use this equation, where theta is an arbitrary angle. We can write this expression in <clears throat> two ways. One is we can apply this to the vacuum, which is, of course, rotationally invariant, and transform it into one. And this to the one nucleon state, and obtain by assumption e to the minus one half <clears throat> one half theta times the original matrix element. One nucleon at rest with spin one. On the other hand, the Lorentz transformation properties of the, or the rotational transformation properties in particular, it seems a bit dim in this room. Should I turn on the, uh, the other lights? I'm not sure which switch controls which. That's not right. Oh, half of them, oh, one of them, two of them are dead. Three of them are dead. A complaint should be made to the janitor. The, um, well, <laughs> the health, public health considerations intervene. You'll all get <laughs> the cost of money manufacturing glasses for all of you whose eyes are ruined by trying to see the lecture in this room. <laughs> uh, if that were the case, it would be silly to remove them from the area nearest the blackboard and keep them at the back of the room. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, um, on the other hand, from the known, the, from the known um, 
Lorentz transformations are rotational transformation properties of these fields. This object is also equal to this, where LZ is not L in non-relativistic quantum mechanics. We never make such a decomposition of the total angular momentum, but the four by four matrix that affects rotations while acting on the four components of psi. Thus we see, in order to match this equation and this equation, this matrix element, the set of four numbers considered as a row vector, as a column vector, excuse me, must be uh, composed only of eigenstates of L sub z with eigenvalue plus one half. Thus, if we work in the standard representation, there's an entry up here, there's an entry here, and the other two must be zero. And this is in the standard representation of the Dirac matrices, which I will use here because it is most convenient for discussing states at rest. <coughs> Thus, at first glance, it looks like we have two independent numbers in contrast to the uh, scalar case where we had only one number to characterize this matrix element, as you see on the left-hand board. But of course, we have not yet used parity. Let's apply that. Both the state on the right and the state on the left are by assumption eigenstates of parity with eigenvalue plus one. The vacuum is certainly parity invariant, and we have said the nucleon state has positive parity. We've written down the equation at the bottom of the previous board. So this equals vacuum psi of 0, 1, p0. On the other hand, by the known parity transformation properties of the nucleon field, the, because we're at the point 0, x into minus x is irrelevant, this is beta, or gamma naught, times vacuum psi of 0, 1, comma, p0. <coughs> And thus, we deduce to have consistency between these equations. Remember, beta multiplies these two entries by plus 1 and these two entries by minus 1. We deduce that b equals 0. And there is, in fact, only one unknown number, the number a, which I will define to be a equals, let me change matters so I don't have to put two m's here. I'll put a square root of two m so it looks just like the free field theory. A equals some number, which I will call z to the 1 half. And by appropriately choosing the phase of the original one nucleon spin up state, I can arrange that z2 is real and positive. <coughs> Thus, um, we have, for this particular state, the matrix element of the fully interacting field between the real physical one particle eigenstates is the same as the matrix element between the free field uh, if we rescale the field exactly as here and define. Someone may want to ask me questions about these equations, so I'll keep them there for a moment. Psi prime equals z2 to the minus 1 half psi. And we then have vacuum psi prime of x, rp, simply by applying rotations and Lorentz transformation properties. If it's like the free field for this one state, it's like the free field for every state that can be gotten from it by Lorentz transformations. e to the minus i p dot x, u r of p. That is to say, it has the same matrix element as the free field. Yes, sir? J is, I'm sorry, uh, the, the fact that we uh, are not in China and therefore have to work with an alphabet with only 26 characters causes some notational confusion. L and M, L in non-relativistic quantum mechanics is of course, and sometimes occasionally when I do a non-relativistic argument, is the orbital part of the angular momentum and operator acting on Hilbert space, whose partner is S, the spin part of the angular momentum. However, in my discussion of the transformation rules for the, uh, of 
representations of the Lorentz group, I used L for a finite dimensional matrix that tells me how the fields transform under rotations, and M for a matrix that tells me how to transform, it transforms under boosts. And I just wanted to tell you that this is L, a 4 by 4 matrix. LZ is gamma naught, gamma 1. Or sorry, gamma, gamma 2, gamma 1, gamma 2. Or I gamma 1, gamma 2. I don't remember. OK. Thus, we can arrange <coughs> that the um, um, phys that by rescaling the field, that the uh, physical um, nucleon uh, state vacuum matrix element of the uh, Fermi field operator, Dirac field operator, is the same as in the free field theory. And thus, we can attain the same thing we attained here. Uh, the reduction formula, et cetera, I will not go through afresh for the Fermi case because it's exactly the same as the derivation in the pure scalar case. There are just more indices floating around, and Fermi minus signs taking care of the conventions in our time-ordered product doing what they should be. Once we have done this, essentially with no changes except making the equations look more complicated because they carry more indices, you deduce that if you write things in terms of this rescaled field and compute Feynman diagrams and put the external lines on the mass shell, then you will compute the correct S matrix elements, just as when we only had Bosch fields to play with. But most of the physics of the argument, the whole kernel of the argument, which was all this hand-waving about particles going off here and particles going off here and momentum supports, and uh, oscillating terms canceling, that whole mod that you, the period you probably remember is the most depressing three hours of your life, <laughs> is, had absolutely none, could be without alteration to give the fields many components, put in a bunch of indices. None of those arguments are sensitive to that spin as in this instance, although not all instances, merely an inessential complication. <clears throat> Thus, our task is the same as before. We have this thing. We have psi prime, which is z2 to the minus 1 half psi. And therefore, we rewrite the Lagrangian in terms of the physical masses, the physical coupling constants, and the renormalized fields, thus generating a bunch of counter terms, which I will write down. Since my notes are in the Science Center library, I do not know if I called them the same things the last time I did it or not. But anyway, you get five counter terms. <coughs> As I recall, last time I wrote the meson part first, so I'll do it here. Maybe my memory is wrong. Prime, prime, the physical mass of the meson. Psi bar prime, I gamma 5, psi prime, 5 prime. And then because this thing, although it is the same shape as this, has not had the same numerical coefficients at all, I have a bunch of counter terms. 1 half A, d mu 5 prime squared, minus 1 half B. I may have called them C and D before. I tried to remember, but my memory isn't very good. Minus C psi prime bar I D slash psi prime minus plus D. I'll make it, now I guess I'll make it plus here and minus here. So it looks just like the term up there. Psi prime bar psi prime minus E psi prime bar I gamma 5 psi prime phi prime. Our task is to write down equations that will enable us to determine the renormalization counter terms A, B, C, D, and E iteratively in perturbation theory, and then we can go. 
As far as this part of the scheme goes, once we've checked this point, that all we've got to do is multiplicatively renormalize psi to give it the right, i.e. identical to free field matrix elements between vacuum and one particle states. The rest of this thing is simply a repeat with almost, in fact, I've made my notation as much as possible to make it look like a repeat of the thing we did for the scalar model. Now, I would like to make a digressive remark in a moment before I start working on this problem, but I should perhaps ask if there are any questions about what I did up till now. Everyone sees how it works. <clears throat> There is one part of this analysis up till now that is not universal. That is to say, I use things, what I used was Lorentz invariance. Well, every theory we're going to look at is Lorentz invariant, translation invariance, ditto, rotational invariance, that's just a subgroup of Lorentz invariance, CPT to connect the matrix elements with the nucleon with the matrix elements, the matrix elements of psi to those of psi bar. CPT we learned at the end of last lecture was universal. But the one thing I have used that doesn't have a taste of universality is parity. We might want to use, study, parity non-conserving theories. Now, when I first taught this course back in the early Neolithic era, the, uh, I didn't bother to discuss how you would do this renormalization if you had a non-parity conserving theory, because the only non-parity conserving theories people studied believed to describe the real world were weak interaction theories. It's only the weak interactions that violate parity. And at that time, there were no renormalizable weak interaction theories, so why bother? You could write down the prescription, but the answers would be infinite. Uninteresting. Well, since then, things have changed. Do the work done in this very laboratory. There are now renormalizable weak interaction theories. It's rather, rather more complicated than this. But still, I would like to make a digressive remark about how at least this part of the analysis changes. It's actually very trivial if we have a theory that is not parity conserving. In this point, if there is no parity conserving, so this is digression. It's really very simple, and we'll just take a few lines. What if there is no parity? If we can't use parity conservation, what do we do then to make a field that has the same matrix elements as the free field? <clears throat> the object that comes to our rescue is, as it turns out, gamma 5. In the standard representation, gamma 5, as you recall, turns positive energy states into negative energy states. Sorry, I shouldn't say that. Positive frequency solutions into negative frequency solutions at rest anti-commutes with beta, which determines the difference between them, commutes with uh, all the Lorentz generators. And therefore, it is easy to see that up to a phase, I found the phase by actually doing the multiplication. Gamma 5 is this in the standard representation of the Dirac matrices in block form. Therefore, if I have this equation here, I know um, that if I take gamma 5 psi, an object that has exactly the same Lorentz transformation properties as psi, because gamma 5 commutes with the Lorentz matrices, and look at it in this particular standard state, I will just interchange the coefficients b and a. That's an elementary exercise in multiplying a matrix by a vector, which I presume you can do. Therefore, uh, the analog of the stratagem in a parity non-conserving theory is simply to define psi prime. I'm sorry, I fluffed out my kinematic factor, root 2m. Psi prime equals a psi minus b gamma 5 psi. That knocks out this entry here. And um, to make the other entry right, I have to divide by a squared minus b squared. And then psi prime will have uh, just a 1, or I should properly say a square root of 2m in the first entry and zeros everywhere else. Of course, when I make that kind of substitution, 
In a Lagrangian like this, I'll get all sorts of terms involving d slash gamma 5 and things like that, all sorts of parity non-conserving terms, but I should. I've started out with a parity non-conserving Lagrangian. <laughs> I have a lot more counter terms, and therefore I won't carry through the parity conserving case, parity non conserving case, any way further than this. But uh, that's the general story. It just means life gets a little bit uglier. The fewer symmetries you have, the more counter possible kinds of counter terms you have to worry about. <laughs> Are there any questions about, uh, about this? Now, we have five counter terms here, and therefore we need to construct five renormalization conditions that will fix these five counter terms. These conditions will express the fact that um, the um, Physical charge is whatever we decide to define it as, presumably by some nice experiment that's directly connected to physically observable quantities, the physical coupling constant, that the meson field is properly normalized, that the nucleon field is properly normalized, that the physical mass of the meson is mu, that the physical mass of the nucleon is m. Of course, for the meson, we've already gone through all the analysis. Since nothing we said about the meson field alone, in particular about the meson two-point function, the system ordered product, the corrected propagator, is, uh, is uh, altered in the slightest way by the fact that some of our intermediate states have that we summed over might have had spin one-half particles in them. So for them, we at least have two of the five things we are looking at from our previous analysis. And let me remind you of those for the meson. I'll put them on the sideboard here because I'll continually do the nucleon case in order to avoid boring you by parallelism, saying at obvious points, this is the answer, etc. As you recall, we began by studying the full Green's function For one meson in, one meson out, the t Fourier transform of the time-ordered product of two meson fields. And I defined this. There was always, of course, an energy momentum conserving delta function. I guess I write it that way if they're both oriented in. And then by Lorentz invariance, the remainder had to be a function which I call d prime of p squared, only a function of p squared. The, uh, I then derived a spectral representation for d prime of p squared by putting in a bunch of intermediate states and summing over states. Because the fields were properly normalized, I got this contribution from the one particle intermediate states. And then there was an, in general, a unknown continuum. which could be thought of as a continuous superposition of free particle propagators, because as far as this field knows, the only difference between creating a discrete one particle state and a many particle state is that the masses are averaged, are smeared out, rather than standing at a fixed point. DA squared, thank you. This implied that uh, D prime was an analytic function. In fact, uh, we also have the condition that was useful for general purposes, but not uh, important to the renormalization program, that sigma was greater than or equal to zero. Hmm? Mu squared, thank you. <coughs> this meant, I'll make a little drawing up here that if we drew the complex p squared plane, extended p squared to a complex variable, d prime was an analytic function, except for a cut, beginning at wherever the lowest threshold is, and the pole at mu squared. That is to say, it was uh, the other part was analytic near p squared equals mu squared, and uh, this, the, uh, this part gave us a pole. We then folded this in with a purely diagrammatic analysis. 
And most I looked at the one particle irreducible part of this thing. And does anyone here remember? I couldn't remember last night if I put the energy momentum conserving delta function in or out of the definition of one particle irreducible things. Did I leave it in? No, I left it out. OK. So this is I defined to be minus i sigma prime, uh, not sigma prime, pi prime, which was also a function of p squared. I then studied the equation Etc. plus dot dot dot, and found an analytic form. This meant d prime of p squared equals i, and I should have put an i epsilon in here when I wrote this down, otherwise I don't know what side of the cut I'm on, equals i over p squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon minus pi prime of p squared. And from this, I deduced my two renormalization conditions that fixed what I am now calling the A and B counter term. Pi prime of mu squared equals d pi prime dp squared evaluated at mu squared equals 0. This is just a repetition of what we went through before, sketching out for your memory what, uh, what happened because I want to parallel each of these steps for the case of the Fermi field, where there are really no particularly grave complications except those caused by the fact that the Fermi field has four components, and therefore we have to worry about that. But some people may have fallen asleep during one of those early lectures or may have weak memories, so if you have any question about what I have sketched out here, please ask it now. No. Could you go through the argument of why you insisted that the derivative of pi prime of mu squared equals zero? Yes, because if it had a term proportional to p squared minus mu squared, that would have affected the residue of the pole, and the field would not have been properly renormalized. Okay, if I expand this out and there is a term of order p squared minus mu squared, I absorb that in this, and the whole thing changes the residue of the pole. For example, if I looked at the corresponding operator for the unrenormalized propagator, OK, that value, pi prime of, uh, of, I shouldn't call it pi, prime, I should have just called it pi, defined the same way for the unrenormalized fields, would I guess have the property that pi prime of p squared would have to be uh, 1 minus uh, z2 inverse, 1 minus z3 inverse, so the residue with the pole would be z3, right? 1 plus 1 minus z3 inverse is z3 inverse. And then I bring that upstairs in the z3 over p squared minus mu squared. Is that helpful, or did that confuse you further? <laughs> yeah. Now, I should have kept this Lagrangian up high here, because it's what we're always looking at. Well, I'll just give myself a little less space to work in. have written it so big and so low. I'll try and remember that all of this is sacred and I only have a board and a half to work in. The first step is to uh, study, just as here, the one nucleon Green's function, the sum of all Feynman graphs with a one nucleon field and one anti-nucleon field in arbitrary configuration. Of course, this will, like everything else in the world, have an energy momentum conserving delta function in front of it. But now it is a set of um, four by four matrices, and therefore we have to expand it in the set of all possible four by four matrices. We could have a multiple of the identity matrix, which by Lorentz invariance, well, I've already used A, B, C, and D, so let me use little letters here. 
could be a function, an arbitrary function of p squared. In principle, although I will shortly eliminate it, we could have a gamma 5. I don't know this function is real or anything, so I won't bother to put the i in the gamma 5 times another function of p squared. We could have gamma mu. I'm going through the list of Dirac matrices. Of course, for Lorentz invariance, that must be multiplied by p mu, the only vector in the problem, to make things transform right. So I could have c of p squared times p slash. That's p mu gamma mu. I could have d of p squared times p slash gamma 5. And I could have something proportional to e of p squared times sigma mu nu. And then sigma mu nu would have to have a p mu dotted into it and a p nu dotted into it. And that term, fortunately, I can drop out immediately because sigma mu nu is anti-symmetric. And this is just known as 0. <laughs> Now, if I didn't have a parity conserving theory, I could have all five, four of the terms I have displayed. But parity gives us an enormous simplification. The terms with the gamma fives have the wrong parity transformation properties to be the matrix element of a field that transforms under parity this way. I don't have to work it out. It's obvious that however they transform under parity, they'll transform opposite to these. <laughs> and these I know are right because they're there in zeroth order. So these must be wrong. <laughs> so I'll just zero by parity, and likewise for this one. Hmm? If you didn't have parity, you pick up the other two terms. In a way, that's obvious, because if I start just start out with the conventional field and redefine it in the way I had to do for wave function renormalization with a gamma 5 in it, I'll have psi plus some constant times gamma 5 psi, then the cross terms I'll get m gamma 5 and p slash gamma 5. <laughs> so yeah, they've got to be there. And it's important there. In that case, of course, though, there would be renormalization counter terms that would fix the, fix, subtract from them. <laughs> However, I'll stick for the moment, because now the parity really makes a real simplification to the parity conserving case, the model we're looking at. And therefore, I have just two unknown scalar functions, a of p squared p slash plus b of p squared with an, I have them completely reversed and totally screwed up. C of p squared p slash. Now, <coughs> given I, these two functions, a and b, I could consider them for, let me consider them for the moment as functions of some scalar variable, which I will call z. And I will define a function I will call s prime of z as simply a of z squared. z is just a number, a complex number, plus z of z squared z. Certainly, I could construct such a function given a and b here. And certainly, from s prime of z, I could reconstruct a and b, one being connected to the even part of the function and the other being connected to the odd part of the function. And this it suggests a very useful way of writing this thing, of writing this as a single function. This is the definition of s prime of z. a of p squared plus p slash c of p squared can be written as a function, that same function of a matrix p slash. Because, of course, as we all know, p slash squared equals p squared from the properties of the gamma matrices. Therefore, instead of considering this as two scalar coefficient functions, both of which are unchanged as p goes into minus p, we can consider it as a single function with no particular oddness or evenness properties of the variable p slash. And that's indeed what we'll do. There's no ambiguity because there's only one matrix in the problem, and one matrix always commutes with itself. 
You don't have to, if you want to know what the sine or a cosine or the 17th power of a single matrix is, that's unambiguous. You don't have to worry about orderings or anything like that. This is the part where things would have become much harder if we had kept doing the parity non-conserving case, because then we would have matrices around that wouldn't commute with each other. Particularly, we would have gamma 5 around that commutes with almost nothing. <laughs> Now, this takes care of stage one. We've expressed things in terms of a function that's analogous to d prime. That is s prime. Instead of being a function of the scalar variable p squared, it's a function of the matrix p slash. Now, part two, deriving the spectral representation. I will write down the spectral representation and tell you first and it will look totally mysterious to you, and then I will explain where it came from. And you will see that in your own head, you will be able to go through all the steps, or if not in your own head in front of me, when I'm not looking at you with my beady eyes you will, uh, later this <laughs> evening, you'll be able to figure it out. integral from a lower bound, which in perturbation theory is m plus mu squared to infinity. p slash plus a, p squared minus a squared plus i epsilon. This term is a superposition of I should have written the first term in a uniform way, and I also shouldn't have. There's going to be more. Is there going to be lyophiles? Yeah, I'm sorry. Let me write the whole thing, write the first term over again. Then there's going to be a third term, which is a bit of a surprise, and I'll explain where that comes from. slash minus a now that I've written the three terms down I'll explain where they come from remember the derivation of the old spectral representation we began with the unordered product no time ordering symbol and put in a complete set of intermediate states from the one particle intermediate states we got the same result as in the free theory because as far as one particle states go, you can't tell the renormalized field from the free field. <laughs> from the higher states, we had all sorts of states that could be made by hitting phi of the vacuum with phi of naught. All those states gave us a, looked like a, they all had the same quantum numbers as a single particle in the frame in which their momentum was purely uh, pointed purely in the time direction. They were states of angular momentum zero. The only thing was that there was a continuous distribution of them rather than a single isolated point, and therefore we got a continuous smeared out integral of one particle things. Okay, that's in essence a uh, fortune cookie sized description of what we did there. We went through all the steps in detail. Now, what happens here? Well, we'll do exactly the same thing. We'll have a contribution from the one particle intermediate states when we expand the product of two field operators, a psi and a psi bar, in terms of one particle intermediate states. This is it. It will give us the same result as in the free theory. We don't have to do it twice, because as far as that st those states go, we get the free theory. <coughs> now we consider this, all the other continuum states whose mass, of course, begins in perturbation theory, at least, is m plus mu squared, the meson nucleon threshold, that we can make <coughs> by hitting the vacuum with a psi bar of 0. Now we can make two kinds of states in the rest frame of the states. The two upper components of psi, which are even under parity, can make states of spin 1 half in their rest frame and parity plus. Those states are just like one nucleon states, except they're smeared out in mass. And therefore, we get a smeared out thing with an appropriate smearing function. 
of one nucleon propagators. Okay, any question there? On the other hand, if we're not looking at a one nucleon state, we could have make states that are this. So sigma plus comes from intermediate states when we write out the spectral representation that are one half plus states in their rest frame, their center of mass frame. On the other hand, there are not just one half plus states. Even in perturbation theory, we not only have nucleon and antinucleon in P waves, which makes one half plus nucleon and antinucleon, nucleon and meson in P waves. We also have nucleon and meson in S waves, which are one half minus. The one half minus states are only connected to the vacuum in their rest frame by the two lower components, because it's the two lower components of psi that are odd under parity, that are eigenstates of beta with odd eigenvalue, and they contribute this. In the rest frame of P, the momentum P, this uh, P squared equals A squared. Remember when we did the unordered product, it was a delta function, and it became this thing only because of the intervention of the theta function. This thing is a projection operator on the two lower components. It has a minus sign, which may make you think I am doing things batty because it should be positive definite. But that's because psi bar has a minus sign in its definition for the two lower components. So this would be a positive definite operator if I were looking at the matrix element of psi with psi adjoint. And sigma minus is also greater than 0. But under rotations, a sum of two spot poly spinners, one for the two upper components and one for the two lower. Are these words sufficient? If not, more words can be added to them ad libitum. Any requests for more words? I'm not sure the detailed derivation of this thing may be in Bjorkin and Drell. I, does anyone know? Certainly in many other texts. Now, this equation is sometimes written in the even more suggestive form obtained by, now I'm really running out of space. Obtained by, uh, rational, by unrationalizing the denominator. Equals I over p slash minus m plus i epsilon plus integral sigma plus of a squared da squared p slash i over p slash minus a plus i epsilon, where a is the positive square root of a squared, of course. <laughs> and uh, the other term is plus integral sigma minus of a squared da squared i over p slash plus a minus i epsilon. It's always add a negative imaginary part to the mass, as you can check by working things out. In this form, we can discuss the analytic properties of S prime as a function of P slash, or perhaps the analytic properties of S prime of Z, the function of a single variable obtained by replacing P slash the four, by four matrix P slash by a complex number Z. But I'll just be a slob and say we'll study the analytic properties for complex P slash. I hope you know what I mean by that. <laughs> it's, you don't know. I see people say Z. And analytic properties of S prime of Z, a number as a function of Z. <laughs> we see from this, of course, not an even function anymore. It'll have a pole as Z equals M, the physical mass of the particle. It will have from the sigma plus term a cut that gives you singularities when z equals m plus mu squared or larger. And from this term, it will have a corresponding cut going off on the left-hand axis, because this term becomes singular if I replace p slash by z when z is a sufficiently large negative number. 
But the general feature, that looks a little bit different than the corresponding drawing up here. There's a left-hand cut as well as a right-hand cut. But the general feature remains the same. The statement that the renormalized mass of the particle is uh, m, gives us the location of the pole. And the residue of the pole is given to us by the scale of the fields. OK, is everyone happy? We have reached this stage. We have done this, and this, and this, and we now have to go on to do this. Does everyone understand the drawing? Of course, the drawing is just the structure and perturbation theory. If bound states develop, there may be further poles around here someplace due to the bound states. On this side, if they're positive parity, and on this side, if they're negative parity. <laughs> And the, the bound states are sufficiently low. You might even move the location of the cut. You might have a bound state that's lighter than either the nucleon or the meson, in which case the cut will move down from m plus mu, etc. But the general features are as sketched. Now. People are looking blank. I hate it when you look blank. I much prefer you ask questions. Yes? Did you say the cut begins at z equals m plus mu squared? No, m plus mu, of course. This z is the, a is the positive square root of a squared. Since the cut begins here, it begins at m plus mu here. And this is minus m plus mu. If I said quantity squared, I was that was a lapsus lingua. Yes? How do you translate that into a statement about what happens when we actually Hmm? Well, I don't know what an analytic function. An analytic function of a May single matrix is a function that would be an analytic function of a number if you replace the matrix by a number. <laughs> <laughs> I normally say E to the A is an analytic function of the matrix, finite dimensional matrix A, meaning it has a powers convergent, power series expansion, and powers of A at points where everywhere in the complex plane. I say the square root of A is an analytic function of the matrix A, aside from the places where the determinant of A vanishes, and so on. Yeah. But when I, t I will later write down equations where I say differentiate with respect to a matrix, and for the benefit of purists, since there's only a single matrix involved, that means replace the matrix by a number, differentiate it by the ordinary rule invented by Weierstrass, and then <laughs> replace the number by a matrix again. <laughs> okay. And we're not using any more complicated definition of d by dp slash, which is what's going to replace the d by dp squared here. Okay, I, I just wanted to know for which matrices that, that pole would be. Hmm? That is the d of which, which matrices? Oh, are those for which the eigen, which have eigenvalues m. Oh, okay. Okay. For which one of the eigenvalues is m. <laughs> right, because if you diagonalize the matrix, then it is just the... That is to say, either uh, either one on the upper light cone or one on the upper light upper hyperboloid or one on the lower hyperboloid. Okay. Yeah. Just as here, it's either p on the uh, p on the upper hyperboloid or p on the lower hyperboloid. It gives you an, uh, p squared equals mu squared. Now. I have now, I can now have to, in order to keep my parallelism going, erase the equations I have here. And the next step is to sum up the sequence, define the IPI thing, and sum up the sequence of graphs. Time I see, but you have several weeks to recover it. If it's not time enough, you had better consider going into another line of work. I have a math book in my pocket that advertises well paying careers in hotel and motel management. <laughs> the IPI graphs, just following as before. 
They have, of course, the same parity transformation properties as the full sets of graphs and Lorentz, et cetera. So I define a function of p slash, which is traditionally called sigma prime of p slash. That is the definition of this object. It is, of course, <coughs> just parallel to this definition over here, except it's now a function of p squared times 1 plus a function of p squared times p slash and therefore is summed up into a single function of p slash, as done for f. The geometric series. Well, a geometric series, I won't even bother to write it down. It looks exactly the same as before. Everything is a function of matrices and this matrix multiplication, but they're all functions of a single matrix p slash, so they all commute with them, so that <laughs> So, <coughs> I obtain s prime equals i over p slash minus m, the zeroth order propagator, plus i epsilon minus sigma prime of p slash. No different. Just the propagator is p slash 1 over p slash minus m instead of 1 over p squared minus mu squared. The IPI part, the self-energy operator, is sigma prime instead of pi prime. The conditions that the polar of this thing is at p slash equals m, or if I consider it as a function of a number, that the pole is at p slash equals m, says that sigma prime of m equals 0. The condition that the residue of the pole be 1 is something I will write in notation that is standard, but nevertheless affects some people like fingernail scraping over a blackboard. d sigma prime d p slash, meaning treating p slash as a number, evaluated at p slash equals m equals 0. <clears throat> exactly parallel to this. Just as a linear function of p slash instead of a quadlinear function of, it's a function of p slash instead of a function of p squared, but otherwise the equations are in perfect parallelism. Exactly as these equations enable us iteratively to determine a and b, order by order in perturbation theory, these equations enable us to determine c and d, iteratively order by order in perturbation theory. Any questions? <coughs> A triumph of clear organization, no questions. <laughs> now, uh, before, just as in the uh, previous lecture, before going on, which will occupy my overtime, to discuss the E, the uh, proper, the most, uh, of course, um, discuss the uh, convention for determining the renormalized coupling constant, and therefore E, order by order in perturbation theory, a convention which, just as before, is much more a matter of taste than the other one. We want to write a nice, elegant definition that will connect it to something that we can observe in some conceivable experiment, and that requires a little taste. If we were just interested in getting rid of infinities, we could define it any which way as the three-point function at any old point. The, uh, I would like to give a specific example, and therefore I will, Following what I did last time, compute sigma prime of p slash to lowest order in g squared. Since I have now done with this thing, I can at last erase this and make more blackboard space. This will be interesting because it will be a computation that will involve manipulation of Dirac matrices as well as internal loops. I will not carry it out all the way. When I get things down to integrals that can be found in our integral table, I will stop. But I will want to get the matrix structure. So, to order g squared, the first non-trivial order. We have two kinds of graphs. We have this graph. And we have the counter terms, evaluated, of course, only to second order in G, using exactly the same notation as was used three weeks ago. Maybe it was four weeks ago before Thanksgiving. The, uh, thus, we have two contributions. p 
slash minus, let's see, e to the i h, e to the i minus i h, e to the i l plus i, c, c evaluated to second order, p slash plus d evaluated minus d evaluated to second order times an i times nothing, times one. Using this by the same reasoning as before, for the simple kind of derivative interaction, the result of the derivative is just a power of momentum. Now, C2 and D, this is the contribution from the Feynman graph. C2 and D2 are determined by renormalization conditions, which tell us that we must add a term proportional to a constant and a term proportional to p slash such as the function and its first derivative are equivalently a term proportional to a constant or a term proportional to p slash minus m, such as the function and its first derivative with respect to p slash vanish at the point p slash equals m. Therefore, I have sigma prime of p slash equals sigma Feynman of p slash minus sigma Feynman evaluated with p slash set equal to m minus d sigma Feynman d p slash evaluated m times p slash minus m. It's the same reasoning as before, except that instead of p squared, I've got p slash. And instead of p squared minus mu squared, I have p slash minus m. Otherwise, there is not the slightest alteration, not by one jot nor tittle, of anything. I've often wondered what a tittle was. <laughs> no, nothing. You know? Oh, a jot is a little dot. Hmm. I will look it up in the Oxford on a bridge and let you know after Christmas. <laughs> There's not the slightest, alter, slightest alteration in what has gone before. Of course, the computation is a bit different because it's a dynamically different theory and we have to manipulate matrices. So let's go and do that. Any questions about this? See what a difference it makes to be awake when you're giving a lecture of this kind. Now, just to remind you, the relevant part of the interaction Lagrangian is G minus G psi bar i gamma 5 psi. So um, we must evaluate sigma prime Feynman, sigma Feynman, or I should say minus i sigma Feynman, because that's what the graphs give us. Oh, five. Yes, that would be a rather simple theory. <laughs> <laughs> I'll call this momentum p. This outgoing momentum is also P. I'll call this momentum P plus K, oriented along the line. And I'll call this momentum K running this way, so that energy momentum conservation is obeyed at every vertex. Well, it's second order, so we get minus IG squared. It involves a internal momentum, so we have D4K over 2 pi to the fourth. We have no factors from the external propagators because this is an IPI graph and the external, there aren't any external propagators. So we just have the matrix product. The product, firstly, of the boson propagator. Then going along the line here, head before tail, I gamma 5. I, P slash plus K slash minus M, P plus K squared minus M squared plus I epsilon, I gamma 5. No, new, no U and no U bar because this is not a scattering matrix element. This is not a number. It is a propagator, which is a genuine 4 by 4 matrix. Yeah, but otherwise, what we would put the U and U bar on. Is there any question in anyone's mind where this expression came from? 
This is the bottom line running across. This is the curvy line, and the others are standard factors. No questions. OK, well, we can simplify. Of course, this is a divergent integral. But of course, we've got counter terms that are going to take care of that. Also, it's not going to be quite as easy to see as it was before. I um, can gather together all of my eyes. There are, I have, I'm Argus. I have 1, 2, that's a minus 1. 1, 2, that's a minus 1. 1, 2, that's a minus 1. So uh, that's 1 minus sign. Then I'll multiply it by i. Sigma f equals i g squared over 2 pi to the fourth. Drag that out. Keep from having to write it. I'll bring the gamma 5 through, changing the sign, and then annihilating the gamma 5 on the other side, or I should say multiplying it and becoming 1. So I have integral d4k one over k squared minus mu squared plus i epsilon one over p squared plus two k dot p plus k squared minus m squared plus i epsilon <coughs> minus p slash because the gamma five has gone through it minus k k slash, and this should have been a plus m, someone should have caught me on that, plus m. Is everyone still happy with this expression? Now, the next step is always the same. I write the integral in a parametric form. Ditto, integral d4k integral from 0 to 1 dx. <coughs> p slash plus, I'm, not, I'm, o, I'm only combining denominators. I'm not combining numerators. k squared times x plus 1 minus x is nothing, plus 2k dot p. I'll call that the x term, plus p squared x minus m squared x minus mu squared 1 minus x plus i epsilon quantity squared. Hmm? Did I make a mistake? No. Oh. Thank you. Plus M. Plus M. Plus M. Okay. okay, is it now? Yeah, it's always P slash plus M over P squared minus M squared. Okay, that's 1 over P slash minus M. The free propagator is P slash plus M over... I agree with the top line, but then you bring a minus sign to it. I don't see a minus sign in front of the M. That's because M commutes with gamma 5. <laughs> <laughs> I said it anti-commuter with practically everything. I did not include one. <laughs> okay. Now, the next step is to shift the momentum, hoping to be verified later that our subtraction, the uh, counter term subtractions will be enough to make, in fact, the integral conversion. So such a shift will be justified a posteriori. It's giving us no surface terms. And the fine k prime, exactly as before, in fact, although I doubt if anyone remembers this was the particular shift we did before, k plus px, or k equal k prime minus px. I thus have sigma Feynman equals I g squared over 2 pi to the fourth. The I, of course, will be canceled subsequently by rotation in Euclidean space. And did I do my signs right? I was getting every member. There's an overall minus sign missing when I added up my I's. Minus, 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 multiplied by I. Yeah, it's minus I. You're right. Thank you. That's 
that kind of mistake, I'm sorry I can't help myself from making, but you're not going to remember this step by step. <laughs> you're going to remember, remember how I did it, right? You write down a lot of mysterious equations and you erase a lot and curse a lot. That's how she was. <laughs> okay. So course and follow every course in Feynman diagrams is a course and follow language. No. <laughs> See for <laughs> to go from zero to one dx. The denominator becomes k prime squared plus p squared x minus x squared. That's the same as multiplying by 1 minus x minus m squared x minus mu squared 1 minus x plus i epsilon quantity squared. The denominator is the same as was in our previous boson calculation. The numerator, I have to replace k by k prime according to this formula. So I get minus p slash times uh, 1 plus x, I guess. Huh? No, 1 minus x was a minus k slash. Plus m, unaffected by the shift, minus k prime slash. Now the k prime slash term is irrelevant because I'm integrating d4 k prime, which in particular means I integrate over positive k prime and negative k prime indiscriminately. So this term vanishes upon integration. It is the integral of an odd function. And there's the denominator is even in k prime. Thus we have explicitly displayed the result as some function of p squared times p slash plus some function of p squared times the identity matrix, which is what we anticipated, of course, the only thing that could happen as a result of Lorentz invariance. We now have to make our subtractions to produce the exact sigma. We must subtract the value at m and we must subtract the first derivative with respect to p slash at m. So sigma prime. As it stands, this integral is still divergent. <coughs> now a horrendous number of terms, as before, minus p slash 1 minus x plus m this is going to be a real mess, and it's only out of a misguided puritanism that I write down the whole thing. But I want to see you. How, I want to show you how it works out in full detail in at least one case. That's the first term. That's just a recopying of what we have up there. Now the next thing we're instructed to do is to subtract the value at p slash equals m or p, which is a fortiori, p squared equals m squared. So that's why I put that curly bracket there. I subtract the value at p slash minus m. m1 minus x plus m. It has obviously can be simplified, but I shall not do so for the moment. Better, in fact, not to leave it there. k prime squared plus m squared x 1 minus x plus, with your permission, dot, 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 the other terms as before squared. Yeah, that's my whole thing has a minus sign in front. Thank you. Now, as you see, unlike the, um, the um, uh, previous case, we need all, both of our renormalization subtractions. In the other case, we already got a finite integral at this stage. In this case, we evidently don't. The coefficient of p slash is logarithmically divergent. The coefficient of m is logarithmically divergent. We've merely subtracted the coefficient of m. The p slash coefficient is still logarithmic. I mean, in fact, we haven't even made that finite. We haven't got the right numerator. <laughs> so let's go on and subtract the first derivative.
minus p slash minus m. Now we've got to take the first derivative with respect to p slash and evaluate that at p slash equals m, multiplying this thing. Now we will get two kinds of terms from differentiating the numerator, where there is a big fat p slash, I'll get 1 minus x plus m over the same denominator squared as before. I will also get a term from differentiating the minus 1 minus x plus m. Thank you. And I don't get an m. Bad, I'm suffering from terminal confusion again. <laughs> okay. From differentiating the denominator, I'll get a mess, but it's not really that messy. It's a denominator, so I get a minus sign. I get a minus 2 because it's a square and turn this into a cube. I'm differentiating with respect to p squared, so that gives me 2p4 altogether, p slash, which is 4m times grotesque minus p slash 1 minus x plus m. <laughs> close bracket, close bracket. Now I can hardly praise this expression for its beauty, <laughs> but I can at least ask, <laughs> is it finite? Or have I been leading you down the garden path and been doing my computations in a non-renormalizable theory? Now, would I be so nasty as to give you computations in a non-renormalizable theory? Yes, sir. Can you evaluate Yeah, that's here. That means it's the same denominator as here with p squared. Oh, right. Thank you. Minus m. Now. The last term, I'll evaluate a p slash that equal m. The last term, thank God, is an integral over k cubed. So it's surely finite. <laughs> k to the sixth. Because it's k squared cubed, d4k. That's fine, ultraviolet finite. There are no problems with divergences here. So this is finite. How do all the other terms go? That is, what is the term? proportional to 1 over k prime squared for high k prime in the integrand. Well, let's hope I have not made any drastic sign errors. This whole thing for high k is proportional to the integral d4 k prime over k prime to the fourth. That's the only divergent part at high k. I'm sorry, it's hairy and it made us run over time and I'll run another 10 minutes over time, but you've got to do it at least once. I have from here minus p slash times 1 minus x minus m plus m. That's what comes from this term. From this term, I have plus m times 1 minus x minus m. From this term, I have minus p slash minus m <coughs> times 1 minus x times minus 1 minus x. Now, this is the divergent part of the integral. Isolate it out. Everything else is convergent at high energy. Now, you will please notice that with your help in correcting my sign mistakes, this is, in fact, zero. This one cancels this one. This one cancels this one. And this one cancels this one. <laughs> okay. Now, actually, there is a quicker way to see that it's convergent. I went through all the details to show you that it really worked out if you did all the details. I will now give you a slob's way of seeing that it is convergent. <laughs> okay. The point is the graph we have to deal with can be thought of. First observation, since we know the derivative of the value of sigma prime at p slash equals m, and its first derivative at p slash equals m, and we know its second derivative with respect to p slash squared is equivalent 
to the second derivative of the Feynman graph, since the added terms are just linear in p slash, we know that if we knew d sigma squared Feynman, d p slash squared, fingernails grow twice across the blackboard because I'm differentiating with respect to a matrix twice. This is completely determined sigma prime just by integration, since we know that gives us a second derivative and we know its value. Therefore, if this is finite, this is certainly going to be finite. Written in the crudest possible way, sigma Feynman is proportional to the integral d4k i gamma 5 1 over p slash plus k slash minus m. I suppress the i epsilons, gamma 5, 1 over k squared minus mu squared. Did I make a mistake? i gamma 5. <laughs> it's in the proportionality <laughs> sign. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm? Oh, the code. The code. <laughs> it's an interesting. It's an interesting lining. It says Yves Saint Laurent, thirty dollars at Filing's basement. Now, <laughs> the next, the uh, next, the uh, next. Now, what happens when I differentiate this with respect to p slash? Whenever I differentiate this with respect to p slash, forget about what differentiating with respect to a matrix means. I drag an extra k slash into the denominator. So I differentiate it twice, and I get d4k over something that goes like 1 over the fifth power of k, which is obviously a convergent integral. That is the crude, slovenly argument that the integral is convergent. Okay. The, of course, if you, well, it's not good if you want to compute it. Now, I was going to do also, in my ambition of the previous evening, the Oh, by the way, I should say at this stage, if you actually want to evaluate this darn thing, you have our integral table that's now in the form of expressions that can be done with our integral tables, leaving only the parametric integral to be done. The same remark about divergence course, um, applies to the meson self-energy operator side, of course i gamma 5, 1 over p slash plus k slash minus m, i gamma 5, 1 <coughs> Now, this integral, of course, will only be a function of p squared when all is said and done because I've got the trace. As a scalar function, it's got to be a function of p squared. This integral looks like, I forgot to write down the d4k, an important part of the integral, looks like it is quadratically divergent. But when all is said and done, just by dimensional analysis, whenever I differentiate with respect to p squared, I must drag an extra k squared down into the denominator. It is the second derivative of this thing with respect to p squared that is relevant. Because this is a boson thing, and it's the value at p squared equals mu squared and the first derivative with respect to p squared at p squared equals mu squared that are enter into the renormalization equations. Therefore, once I differentiate with respect to p squared, I turn it from being quadratically divergent into logarithmically divergent because I put a k squared in the denominator. Once I differentiate with, you can't see it from here, but if I did the traces and put things together, it would have to come out that way. It would have to be a p squared and a k squared. Once I differentiate once more with respect to p squared, I turn it from logarithmically divergent to convergent. I turn it from d4k over k squared to d4k over k to the 6. Once again, unlike our other case, what we call what is called a super renormalizable theory, where you don't need all the subtractions of renormalization theory, this is right on the borderline of being possibly renormalizable. Two subtractions are needed, and two subtractions are what the renormalization prescription gives us. 
One would not be enough. One would just turn this from being quadratically divergent to logarithmically divergent, which is better than quadratically, but still divergent. Two are needed here, just as two are needed there. Notice the marvelous way in which the renormalization program just scrapes by and saves us. <laughs> here, where we're differentiating, it tells us to differentiate with respect to p squared. The first graph is quadratically divergent. We need those four powers of k to make it convergent. Here, the prim primitive graph is just, um, <coughs> where was it? It's just linearly divergent. But we're only differentiating with respect to p slash. We need those two powers of k, not those two powers of k squared, to save us. Now, the last topic I was planning to discuss this lecture, and I, I will discuss only if people say, yes, yes, go on for another 10 minutes. Otherwise, I'll talk about it in 10 minutes after Christmas, is the condition. Well, come on, you always want, you're a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> Do people want, I, I'm, I, I'm perfectly free. I'm all steamed up. I'm willing to talk on for another 10 minutes or I'm willing to stop. <laughs> okay, I'll talk fast. <laughs> okay, the topic is, the topic which I will maybe only do in, is the condition we write to satisfy, fi I will finally discuss the final renormalization condition the one that fixes E, the definition of the renormalized coupling constant G. There are some cunning things here. You recall in our boson theory, where we had this sort of thing, theory with the scalar nucleons, we had this sort of thing. We defined this to be minus I gamma of p squared, p prime squared, and q squared, where the momenta were as such. This is memory of the boson theory. Gamma was g plus corrections of order g squared, g cubed, in fact, in general. We defined it to be, we put the definition that fixed e that said that gamma on the mass shell, a point we could get to by an analytic continuation, you had to take by trust for me, equals g. OK, that was our old definition, the definition of the renormalized coupling constant, g. The great advantage of this definition is that when we discuss processes like meson nucleon scattering, with scalar mesons and scalar nucleons, with all sorts of corrections to the vertices and the internal nucleon line. This was uh, the um, blot that the coefficient of this thing, of the pole in this process, the S channel below threshold pole or the T channel below. T-channel unphysical pole in uh, nucleon, nucleon scattering was given exclusively in terms of G, because to get the residue of the pole, all these lines had to be on the mass shell. That made that a very nice definition to give us something that was physically measurable in this hypothetical theory. Now, everyone remembers that. Now, do, I will try and do the same thing in the real theory with the current theory, I should say the real theory, you know, the real theory is actually quarks and abelian gauge mesons, uh, not abelian gauge mesons, as we all know, in this current, <laughs> this current theory with, uh, <laughs> that's, the doctrine, that's the doctrine of the ruling classes this year. Come back two years from now and it'll be different. <laughs> uh, the, um, the uh, th current theory in which we have fermions, and we have uh, Dirac spinners, and things are a complicated matrix structure. I write exactly the same thing, but these are, of course, Fermi lines. And therefore, this is a 4 by 4 matrix. I define this to be minus i gamma prime. And I'll just say it's a function of p, p prime, and q. Or again, I'll label the momentum, say, like this, so that p 
P prime equals P plus Q. Now this thing is in its matrix is in perturbation theory, of course. It starts out very simple. It's gamma prime equals I gamma 5 times G plus order G cubed. However, a technical obstacle arises, which must be surmounted. And that technical obstacle is, this in general will contain all sorts of god-awful matrices because you have two vectors to play with. You can write P slash, P prime slash. You can write P slash. You can write Q slash. You can write sigma mu nu, P mu, P prime nu. Some of them will be thrown out by parity and things, but most of them will survive. It's a horrible object, so we can't say that at some particular point, this is equal to gamma 5 times g, because that would be too many restrictions. We can certainly adjust matters to the coefficient of gamma 5 is what we want by picking our counter term as we please. But we've got all those other coefficients. Therefore, I will look at a simpler object. Sorry, wrong side. I'll stick in these little projection matrices, OK? And look at this, restricted for the moment, to p squared equals p prime squared equals m squared. For the moment, I'll keep this thing off the mass shell. I'll keep the meson off the mass shell. And write this as, <coughs> I will demonstrate for you in a minute that this is i gamma 5, well, sorry, p slash, p prime slash, plus m, i gamma 5, p slash plus m, times some function. I don't know what I'll call it. I'll call it capital G of q squared. That is to say, this thing is determined by one scalar function of the remaining variable once I've set these things on the mass shell q squared. Now, I'll demonstrate that in a minute, as I said. But during that minute, before I demonstrate it, I want to say, have I really lost any useful information by looking at these object, this object rather than this object? The answer is no. Because if I look at this process here, it's true I only know this thing with a p slash plus m on the left. But on the left, I've got a fermion propagator evaluated at a pole. The fermion propagator evaluated at the pole at p squared equals m squared has residue p slash plus m. So this combination, this thing comes in automatically if I look at the residue of the pole in the scattering process. What about this thing? It doesn't come in automatically if I look at the residue of the pole in the scattering process. No, but what comes in automatically is a U. <laughs> and a U has the property that P slash plus M acting on it just multiplies it by 2M, since P slash U is MU. <laughs> So I may have restricted myself in what I can look at by destroying this marvelous risk structure of 42 different combinations of Dirac matrices by putting this thing here and this thing there. But I've saved all the parts that are important when I'm computing the residue in the pole in the on-mass shell scattering process. Is everyone happy? <laughs> Some of you may be regretting giving me those extra minutes, but I, <laughs> aside from that, are you happy? OK, good. That means you're either happy or nervous and anxious to get out. <laughs> now, the next, <laughs> the next, so I haven't lost anything. Now let me demonstrate that. I'll give a quick, dirty demonstration. And then <clears throat> it's just, you know, it's a little technical thing. It's not deep or anything. Uh, this thing with the, with the nucleons, on the mass shell, but the meson off, can be thought of as a variety of processes depending upon whether the nucleon lines are on the uh, forward or on the upper or lower mass hyperboloid. It could be the matrix connected by a standard algebra, the thought we used when we were discussing decay processes, to the matrix element of phi of naught between the vacuum and a nucleon antinucleon out state. When some of the fields are on the mass shell, they become in states or out states, depending on where they are. And the others become to stay as fields. 
Or it could be if one, both are on the forward hyperboloid, it could be nucleon phi of zero, nucleon, and there I don't have to say in or out, depending on how I put them, or you know, the nucleon and the antinucleon on the right, and an instate, doesn't matter. Now, all of these things are, of course, connected by analytic continuation. I say, of course, because it takes a month to prove it. But <laughs> they're all obtained from the same function, and it's just a matter of whether q squared is base-like, is positive or negative, which process you're describing. So as far as counting invariants, I might as well count them here or here, see how many numbers I need to describe this process. Now, by Lorentz invariance, I can always choose that the total momentum transferred in this case, here's the meson coming in, nucleon and antinucleon going out. One has momentum p, one has momentum, as I guess I've defined it, minus p prime. This has momentum q. I might as well look at the frame in which q, Time-like must be carry a time-like momentum to make a real pair. It's the total momentum of the pair, the momentum carried by the meson. So I'll make Q equals Q0, 0. Okay? So you hit the vacuum with a field. The field makes a pair. I choose to look in the Lorentz frame which the pair made is at rest. Now, what do I know about the field? Phi of 0 is Lorentz invariant, in particular rotationally invariant. So the final state must have total angular momentum 0. And phi of 0 is a pseudoscalar field. The state you make by hitting the vacuum with phi of 0 is odd under parity. So it must have parity equals minus 1. Now the states of a nucleon-antinucleon pair that are coming out. It's a given value of q squared. You can have L equals 0, S equals 0, adding together to make J equals 0. Or I can have L equals 1, S equals 1, adding together to make J equals 0. This state is parity minus, nucleon, antinucleon in an S wave. This state is parity plus 1. Thus, there's just one invariant amplitude. The amplitude for making this state, which is completely determined once I've given a center of mass energy q squared. If we didn't have parity invariance, we'd have two. But we have parity invariance, we only have one. Thus, this process is indeed described by a single function of q squared. Counting states here. If there were 72 partial wave states it could go into, it would be described by 72 functions of q squared. We have only one. You can also count it this way. That's an amusing exercise. You'll get the same answer. <laughs> one. One. Therefore, we are free to impose our one renormalization condition to wit at q squared equals mu squared, g of mu squared equals g. That is the definition of the physical coupling constant that corresponds to what we did in the boson case. The task is done. Now, after Christmas, there will be three lectures. The first of them, I will be a light lecture to make you feel happy. I will talk about isospin and how it fits in with field theory. We've all seen isospin before. The next one, I will talk about more about renormalization and how it gets rid of divergences. Although I won't try and prove anything, I'll try and tell you what the general theorems are. And after that, I don't know what's going to happen. We're going to get to quantum electrodynamics fairly shortly. Maybe we'll start that in the third lecture.